Um, thank you for coming tonight. I want to talk some about, um, I, I went back and forth between this title and the title of um, Less Policy, More Practice. And I want to argue, uh, or make the argument tonight, that we have done an amazing job of passing policies to protect uh, and support people with autism and other psychiatric and developmental disabilities. And we haven't done enough to change practice about how we care for these individuals in communities. And I want to start in, uh, I want to start in, uh, in 1955. So this is Norristown State Psychiatric Hospital. Um, uh, this used to be our primary means of caring for people with, uh, with psychiatric disabilities, including autism. And uh, we were very proud of these places. In, in 1955, when there were 100 million people living in the United States, um, about 550,000 of them spent at least one night in one of these places around the country. So we, we institutionalized, to some extent, about half, the, half a percent of the, of the population. And we were so proud of these places, we put them on postcards. This is a, a postcard. Um, and of course, this is what these places look like now. Um, uh, we have never done a good job of institutional care in our, in our country. And, and the reason I came to know this place is because the state uh, of Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, has a bureau of, uh, I'm supposed to start this slide. How do I start this? Don't, they will? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, uh, oh, look, there we're counting down. Thank you. So I uh, um, started a Bureau of Autism Services, and they really wanted to know where adults with autism were. And they asked me to go into the state psychiatric hospital to see if I could find any. And I was very skeptical that we would find adults with autism in these places, but we went in with a team of people with expertise in adult autism and uh, and uh, also with expertise in psychosis, and we, uh, we carefully reviewed the charts and records of these individuals, and we found that 10% of them uh, met criteria for autism, uh, but were undiagnosed as such, and were mostly being treated with, um, for chronic undifferentiated schizophrenia, including one person who was diagnosed with autism by Leo Connor in 1954. Um, so we're pretty sure about his diagnosis. And we have done, uh, uh, you know, th this is no longer the way that we think about caring for individuals with autism. Um, and we have passed a tremendous number of policies over the last 50 years to make sure that uh, people with autism and other psychiatric disabilities are able to live in their communities, starting with the Community Mental Health Act of 1963, and then passing uh, uh, laws that for public insurance, the, the Medicaid program. Um, uh, one of the things that I think is particularly important is Medicaid waivers, in which the Centers for Medicaid Services uh, told, uh, uh, told states that if you have a group of individuals who is at high risk of institutionalization, but, uh, and you need services to support them that aren't in your state Medicaid plan, you can make other arrangements to be creative about those services, how you deliver them, and to whom you deliver them uh, to, provide, uh, to provide those services. Um, the Individuals with Disabilities Act in 1990, uh, which is the reauthorization of the Education of All Handicapped Children Act, included autism as a separate category for the first time. And so it guaranteed that children with autism were entitled to a free and appropriate public education in our country. Uh, more recently, we extended that to infants and toddlers. We started to pass autism insurance mandates. Indiana was the first state to pass an autism insurance mandate. As many of you know, private insurance companies uh, disqualify people from, with autism from receiving services, or they severely limit the services that they will pay for. And now, 40-some states have passed autism insurance mandates requiring that commercial insurance products cover autism services. At the same time, states started to develop waivers, Medicaid waivers specifically for uh, children with autism. Now 11 states have autism waivers, which allows them to provide Medicaid services for children who um, who either wouldn't be eligible for those services because of means testing, that is their family income is too high to receive them, or those services weren't originally in, the, in their state plans. And just last year, the, um, the, Medicaid, the Center for Medicaid Services said, explicitly stated that autism treatment can and should be covered by Medicaid, which is, um, for those of you who study this in any detail, is a, is a wonderful coup. Right? So we've done a great job of passing these policies, and I would argue that most of these policies increase access. 
They do a great job of increasing access to all parts of the system of care for individuals, to things like housing, to work, to medical care, to education. But they haven't had the full extent of the effect we would want. In some ways, they've, they've increased access tremendously. So here's a count of the number of individuals with autism who are served through the special education system in the United States. Um, some states didn't fully implement the law in 1990, and so let's give them a few years of a break. But in 1993, there were 23,000 children uh, in the autism special education category. In 2013, there were 478,000 children with autism in that category. Now, the number of children in special education is increasing in the United States in general, but about 15 years ago, Children with autism comprise less than 1% of all children in special education, and now they comprise 8.2% of all students. I, I can, um, and I'd be also happy to have a more, um, a longer and more involved conversation with you a afterwards. And I apologize, I was going under the assumption that most people had at least a passing familiarity with autism here. Is that, is that the case? All right, so br briefly, let me say that autism is a, is, is a neurodevelopmental disorder that's, uh, that manifests in children at a very young age. The hallmark characteristic of this disorder is that it um, is, is social impairment, is, is a lack of ability to engage socially uh, in the way that most infants and children pick up very naturally. It can also be accompanied by a variety of other challenges, including challenges with communication, um, uh, repetitive behaviors, and an assistance on sameness. But like I said, I'd be happy to have a more detailed conversation with you after. Are these uh, statistics slightly skewed because of the failure to diagnose and properly identify autistic ch children in the earlier years? Um, so there, I think there are two parts of that question. One is, we're, n we're not reaching all kids. So if we think about what we know about the prevalence of autism and we compare this to, you know, if we use as a denominator the number of children of this, this these are children ages 6 to 21, um, uh, we don't get a, num a, a percentage that equals what we think of as the community prevalence. Um, so because we're starting at age 6, we are, um, I don't think that that same, uh, that same skewness that is associated with identifying you know, younger children, because we don't do a great job of identifying younger children, is here. But if we were to look at data, if we were to look at data, say, from IDEA Part C, that is the, the data that uh, applies to children who are preschool age or younger, we would see that these numbers as a percentage were much smaller. Uh, but there are a lot of things that go into that, including the fact that that system is in some ways very anti-diagnosis, and so identifies kids for services, but doesn't necessarily identify them as having autism. Um, we also spend a lot of money on these kids. Um, so much more in the public sector than we do in the private sector. So these are data comparing Medicaid expenditures and private insurance expenditures in the United States. And what you find out, what you find among children who are receiving Medicaid reimbursed care for a diagnosis of autism, we are spending an average of $20,000 a year. Now that is just medical care. Right now in commercial insurance, we're, we're not doing such a great job, and in fact, the highest expenditures in commercial insurance, while some is an outpatient, we're spending proportionally a lot more on inpatient and on medication, but it will be interesting to see what these mandates do in terms of changing those numbers. Um, we also see that the number of adults who are served through the vocational rehabilitation system is increasing. This is great. We have what we often refer to as a service cliff for individuals with autism when they hit 21 or 22, when their eligibility under IDEA runs out and they're no longer entitled to that free and appropriate uh, public education. But the vocational rehabilitation program is supposed to pick them up and is supposed to help them prepare for uh, work. Actually, high school is supposed to do that too. Um, and while these numbers don't anywhere near match what we think of as the prevalence of autism and what we would expect to see in adults, these numbers are still going up dramatically. Um, but there are some challenges too. So for example, in Pennsylvania, when we did a study of psychiatric hospitalization in Pennsylvania, we found when we broke this into birth cohorts that more recent birth cohorts were hospitalized at a greater rate than older kids. So if you look at 10-year-olds who were born uh, between 1983 and 1994, and you compared them when they were 10 
to children who were 10 who were born between 1994 and 1999, you find that the risk of hospitalization is greater in that later birth cohort, which suggests that we are hospitalizing more children now than we were before. We, we see the same kind of challenge when we look at education data. So when we look at the proportion of children with autism who spend most of their day uh, uh, with um, mo most of their day in a special education classroom as opposed to with their typically developing peers or in a separate school or in a residential facility, the proportion of those kids remains the same. And I only went back to 2009, but you can continue to go back and you find the same proportions. So we're not getting better at including children with autism with their typically developing peers, which I would argue is another form of, of segregation. Sometimes it's warranted, but on average, we would think as our interventions improve and as we get better, as we identify children younger, that more of them should be able to spend time with their typically developing peers. And if you look at how we spend money on children with autism, we find that some of those numbers are what we would hope them to be and others are not. So for example, if you look at very young children, you find that most of our expenditure, as you would expect, is in special education, is in providing early intensive intervention for young children with autism. And on average, we spend a lot of money on that, about $60,000 per kid. You find that education spending drops precipitously when children leave early intervention and go into kindergarten or first grade. Um, and as they get to adulthood, we find that they have greater medical services. A lot of this is driven by hospitalization and inpatient care. And we spend a lot more in residential care. So despite the fact that we are spending a tremendous amount of money when they're young, we are not seeing what we might expect to see if the money we spent was spent successfully. Now, why is this? We've, you recognize this slide? So why is this? We spend a lot of money on these kids. We have passed a lot of policies. Why are these policies not as effective as we would hope? And I'm now actually going to take you through a handful of slides to, to provide evidence that these policies are not as effective as we would hope, not just in increasing access, but in changing age of diagnosis or improving outcomes for children with autism. So this slide is from Amy Daniels' dissertation, the woman who gave me such a lovely introduction. And so what she looked at was do states that um, enforce or adhere to the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines about screening for autism and other and de developmental challenges, do they identify children with autism at a younger age than states that don't? Because we, we think that entering intervention early is important and therefore early diagnosis is important. And what we find is when you look at the effects of a state being in full compliance with those AAP guidelines or kid, and kids getting the number of, of, of uh, visits that they should, that the average age of diagnosis goes down by one and a half months. So not, not a tremendous effect, a statistically significant effect, but a pretty small effect. This is some early work, which I, this is the first time I'm presenting this, about the autism insurance mandates. We would expect that when a state uh, has an autism insurance mandate, that more children with autism would get diagnosed and get into treatment in, those, in plans where, uh, that are subject to those mandates. And so what we did was compare states when they passed a mandate to states that had not yes pa yet passed a mandate or states um, uh, or kids who weren't eligible for the mandate. So here are kids who wouldn't qualify. And that sort of tells you what the secular trend is. In general, we're getting a little better at getting kids into treatment. And what you find is that when states pass a mandate, so here you see the break point, there is some growth in the number of kids that they serve. But what I didn't show you here is that this is numbers per, this is kids per thousand, right? So if we accept the CDC prevalence of one in 68, which I don't, and we can have another conversation about that, but let's say it's one in 100. Let's say 1% of kids uh, meet, uh, meet criteria for autism. We would expect this when you pass the mandate that kids with autism would get treat, would get diagnosed and treated, and that this would start to approximate 1%. This is 0.5 per thousand. At its best, we get to 2.6 per thousand. The different colors are what year the mandate was passed. So this line, this orange line, are 
are uh, states that never passed a mandate. And this is comparing kids who would have been eligible for that mandate because they're in commercial insurance products and they meet those age requirements for the mandates. If you look at the green line and the red line, those are mandates that are passed in 2010 and, uh, and 2009. So, and so what you see is that there is a spread. And we think that the mandates account for about a 12.5% jump in prevalence. So a small effect, a statistically significant effect, but really small and not getting us to where we want to be in terms of um, identifying children with autism and getting them into treatment. So we also, you can also look at specific um, things like the autism waivers. So here we looked at the Medicaid waivers. And the goal of the Medicaid waiver is explicitly to keep kids out of institutions, right? is to keep them out of the hospital. So we can compare kids who are eligible for Medicaid through the waiver to kids who are eligible for the uh, waiver uh, for Medicaid through disability. Right, because we figure it's it's hard to figure out what the right comparison group is, but those kids who are eligible through disability are probably more impaired than kids who have an autism diagnosis and are eligible through poverty. And what we find out is that you spend more money with the waiver, and you do keep kids out of the hospital. So only two percent of kids who are in the waiver were hospitalized, compared to five percent of kids who are on. Uh, disability. And it actually turns out that there's a certain return on investment. So the more money you spend on your waiver for kids, the more likely you are to keep them out of the hospital. To have this effect, you have to spend about $6,000 per kid per year on the waiver to keep them out of the hospital. And that's when you sort of break even in terms of reducing your hospitalization expenses. So we were excited about that. We're like, great, a policy that works, that seems to have a substantial effect. What is it about this policy that is actually working? Let's look at the services that kids are receiving on the waiver and see what's effective. And it turns out what's effective is respite care. So these are, these are odds ratios. You can interpret them in some ways as, as a form of, of probability. For, for ease of interpretation, let's say that for every $1,000 you spend on respite service use, you reduce a kid's risk of being hospitalized by 8%, right? 100 minus, minus 92. Um, because of the way we designed this study, we are really confident in that number. This is sort of a, a very rigorous analysis called a discrete time analysis for people who care about that. When you look at what we call therapeutic services, so if we look at the behavioral services that we think of as most important for kids with autism, when we look at neurodevelopmental therapies like speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, we find that they have no effect on keeping kids out of the hospital. Right? So an odds ratio of one means it's pretty much equivalent to not getting those, uh, those services. So what is it that's going on that respite care shows an effect? That's great. More states should have respite care. But respite care. So thank you. Uh, let me define that. Respite care is, 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 a, is a form of care that gives caregivers, usually parents, a break. right? So it's saying, we will take your kid for the weekend. We will take your kid for a day um, and give you a break and give you a chance to spend time and attention on your other children, give you a chance to just pull your life together, give you a chance to go shopping. Anyone who's a parent here probably would like some respite care. It's particularly important, I think, for families of children with disabilities. When we do that, we keep kids out of the hospital at a greater rate than when we don't. When we increase the amount of thera therapeutic services, at least through Medicaid, it seems to have no effect on keeping them out of the hospital. I'll, I'll tell you some, in some other analyses that we did, respite care also keeps them out of foster care, and it also reduces the probability that they'll be on multiple pharmacologic agents concurrently, that they'll be on multiple medications concurrently. The therapeutic service use has no effect on whether they go into foster care. It has no effect on how many medications they're using. Why is it that these therapeutic services aren't therapeutic, at least as measured by the admittedly crude outcomes that we have in these claims data? Now, this caused me to ask one of my other doctoral students, Allison Namias, to, I said, can you find out what is the effect of community services? If we look at the control groups from randomized trials, if we go to any study that attempted to measure what treatment in the community results in, what do we find out? And so she called through hundreds of studies to try and pull those data, and she calculated what are called effect sizes. 
So an effect size is, is a metric that compares the magnitude of the difference that you see, in this case, at time one and time two, with the standard deviation. It's a, it's a way of saying, how, how, how good is this therapy? How, how strong an effect does it have? And normally, when you look at a randomized trial of autism intervention and you look at the effect sizes, most of those effect sizes are about 0.7, or when we get to one, we think that that's a, a pretty good effect size. These are the effects of autism intervention in the community. Their effect on cognition, about 0.26, what we would call a, 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 a pretty small effect. 0.15 on adaptive behavior, a very small effect. 0.23 on social ability, and 0.21 on communication. So it turns out, and, and I'll tell you the biggest predictor of, whether the, of, of, the size of, the, of the size of the effect size was whether it was a university or hospital-based program. So if it was a university or hospital-based program, the effect sizes were larger. But, in, but on average, these effect sizes were very small, which fits with the waiver study that we did, suggesting that these therapeutic services aren't having a particularly therapeutic effect. So what some, and, and I also don't know, yes, a, a, a small effect, but I don't know if that effect has to do with developmental maturation in the kid, right? We might expect if you did nothing that you might see effect sizes um, that, that, that large or, or, or larger. Um, so, and, and I use schools as an example. I'm particularly interested in schools because it's where most kids with autism receive most of their intervention. But I think that the principles that I'm going to talk about and that I apply to schools could be applied to issues related to screening and diagnosis, could be applied to the health care that we provide children with autism. So, so how does this work? Um, if you think about how we test interventions, the system we have is one of trying to create um, an efficacy trial. That is, under ideal circumstances, does our intervention work? So what are those ideal circumstances? The ideal circumstance is that I am an intervention developer with decades of experience in autism. I develop an intervention. I submit funding to, uh, to usually to NIH or to another agency to get uh, support. They don't recognize my genius the first time I submit my proposal. And so I submit it again, and finally it gets funding. And so now I have grant funding to ensure that my intervention will be implemented the way it's designed. And so then I hire graduate students or highly trained clinicians, and I train them in my intervention, especially my grad students. They're all a little afraid of me, so they do it exactly the way I ask them to do it. If they don't do it exactly the way I ask them to do it, then I fire them or I train them to fidelity. I make sure they're achieving some kind of benchmark, right? And it turns out that it seems to be always justified to have restrictive inclusion and exclusion criteria in my study. So what does that mean? It means that I can say that my intervention is for three to five-year-olds, but you have to have a developmental age of at least 18 months, and you can't have any sort of self-injurious or aggressive behaviors, and you have to be toilet trained. Whatever it is, I can say that those are the, those are the um, uh, criteria that I can set for sampling, and then I test my intervention. What do I compare it to? I compare it to treatment as usual. The slides I showed you before, right? And what is treatment as usual? Well, we don't really know because we tend not to measure it when we're doing these kinds of studies, and so we don't know how much our intervention overlaps with what's happening in the community or whether there's anything that we would think of as therapeutic in the community, and then it turns out that my intervention works or is better than that treatment as usual. And so I license it, and I sell it to a publishing company, and then it gets distributed. So where does it get distributed to? It gets distributed to these guys over um, in the community, right? So I run a preschool, or I'm a principal, or I'm in charge of autism programming for a school district, and I'm looking for something to do, and I go to a training, or I get a flyer, or an email, and I decide that this is a good program for us, and so I buy it. And now I'm going to change what we're doing, what we had been doing the year before, and we're going to do something different this year. And so I take my teachers or my clinicians, and I train them in it. And how do I train them? Well, I send them to a one-day training, right? And, or as I like to call it, train and pray, right? Because they're going to, someone is going to stand in front of them for six hours and talk to them about this training and show them some videos, right? And then they're going to say, do you have any questions? And the people are going to say, no, we don't have any questions. They don't have any questions for a lot of reasons. Because they went to a different training the year before because last year we were doing something else. And they have, they're not sure how much they want to invest in this new intervention because 
who knows if it's going to be the same the next year. Um, and so they're going to they're hold off and wait, and they saw these beautiful videos. When they have questions, though, is when they go back to their classroom, and they want to know why their kid in front of them in their class is not acting like the kid on the video. Right? And there's no one who then comes into the classroom and says, well, let me help you with this process. Let me coach you. Let me train you. We don't do a very good job of supporting these community clinicians. And ultimately, people are dissatisfied with the progress they've made with that program. And there are districts around the country that are filled with beautiful boxes of these programs that somebody thought were a good idea last year. Right? And this is the ivory tower problem. Right? That the extent to which we study these issues in an ivory tower often has relatively little application or meaning given the real world circumstances under which community teachers and clinicians labor. Um, and this is particularly an issue in large school districts. So there are 18,000 school districts in the United States. The top 100 in size, so 0.6% of all school districts serve almost a quarter of all children in the United States. We have huge disproportionality. And these districts tend to be under-resourced, higher prevalence of uh, people with disabilities. They pay their teachers less, and they train their teachers less. Right? And, but if we want to make change in the lives of children with autism, these are the places we should be looking. Because right, this is where, disproportionately, a huge plurality of them are. Oh, and you guys are here. You're number one. You're the largest school district in the country. All right, so as I don't know how many of you saw The Princess Bride, right? but I often think of Miracle Max and Valerie and their statement, have fun storming the tower. Well, they actually said have fun storming the castle, but, but I care about the ivory tower. Right? So this particularly came to a, um, a head for me in the first randomized trial I did with the School District of Philadelphia. So I thought of myself as an effectiveness researcher, and I partner with the community agencies where I want to test effectiveness. I, had a long, I have a longstanding and very uh, fruitful partnership with the School District of Philadelphia, which is number eight in size. So we don't come close to you guys, but we're pretty far up there. Um, and the district had found two programs that, that, what they, that they wanted to test. What the programs are, I'm happy to talk about in detail, but I'm not sure that it matters. Briefly, one of them was Structured Teaching, which is the program that was developed in North Carolina as part of the TEACH program. And the other was something called STAR, Strategies for Teaching Based on Autism Research, which combines a lot of practices in the family of applied behavior analysis, um, discrete trial training, pivotal response training, teaching and functional routines with a really nice curriculum. And the head of autism programming in the district said, I found these two programs. If you help me implement them, I will let you study them. And that meant we could do a randomized trial. So we randomized 40 teachers to receive training in STAR or structured teaching. We recruited over the course of the study 482 kids. It was a pretty large study. We measured them carefully at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year. We assessed our main outcome measure was something called the differential ability scale. You can think of it as a measure of IQ. And we went into the classrooms every month to observe what the teachers were doing and the extent to which they were implementing the program the way it was designed. And what we found was, when they implemented the program the way it was designed, that STAR did better than structured teaching. So if you see this y-axis, this is your change in IQ. And we saw a, um, a two-thirds of a standard deviation increase in IQ in the STAR group compared to about a third of a standard deviation in the structured teaching group. That's a big gain. That's pretty powerful. When they didn't implement the program the way it was designed, we didn't see a difference between the groups. But the most striking thing to me was what we call program fidelity. That is the extent to which the program was implemented the way it was designed. And what we saw, if you think about it on a 100-point scale, we were going in and checking off and observing what they were doing. On average, star fidelity was 57%, and structured teaching fidelity was 48%. These numbers were pretty low. Now, we had coaches who were going into these classrooms at least once a month, usually more. They were spending half a day there. They were talking with the teacher and developing a relationship with the teacher. They were modeling new practices. They were troubleshooting with them. They were watching the teacher do the practice and giving feedback. And these guys loved each other. These coaches and these teachers loved each other. I loved 
going to professional development because the teachers and the coach would see each other and they would run across the room and there would be music playing in the background and they would hug and they would talk about, especially like in the fall, they would talk about their, um, their uh, summer vacation and show pictures of children and show off new tattoos. It was really lovely. It wasn't an issue of rapport. It's that they weren't doing what we asked them to do. And this is sort of my switch from being an effectiveness researcher, researcher to being an implementation researcher. Why, even under the best of circumstances, in our mind, in terms of the support we can provide, do teachers not implement interventions the way they were designed, even when they know that if they implement, because we show them these data, and we show them these data regularly, not just at the end of the year, but every month. This is how your kids are doing. This is how your kids are doing who are getting a lot of good intervention. These are how your kids are doing who aren't getting good intervention but they don't change their behavior. Now, one possibility is it has to do with schools, right? Public schools, especially in urban environments, can be very difficult environments in which to work. And another of my doctoral students, Hilary Kratz, um, uh, decided to test this. So in September, she went out to schools and she surveyed teachers and classroom assist assistants and other people working in the classroom, and she said, how much is it expected that you're going to do this intervention? How much are you supported in doing it? How much are you rewarded for doing it? And so she measured that in September. And then she went back in May. And she looked at the extent to which they were implementing the program the way it was designed. So we think about those expectations, supports, and rewards as implementation climate. It's a concept we borrow from the business literature. One of the nice things about Penn is we can walk across from the medical school to um, Wharton. Um, and they think about this all the time when Toyota has to rethink how they, how they may manufacture brakes, for example, um, hypothetically. Uh, um, they have to retool plants, and they have to think about what processes they're going to put in place to have their employees um, respond to this new directive, this new mandate. We just, as our new technology, we thought about implementing STAR, and we rated uh, fidelity on a, on a zero to five point scale. And what we find is that we get a, a, a moderate correlation between how, what they reported in September about implementation climate and how much they implemented the program the way it was designed. What was more interesting to me is that there's an interaction between climate and fidelity. So where do we get the best outcome? We get the best outcome when there's high climate and high fidelity. That's that blue line on the top. right? Where do we get the second best outcomes? When there's low climate and low fidelity. So let's think about who these two groups of teachers are. This is one group of teachers that's saying, yes, it's expected, support, uh, it's expected that I'm going to do this program. I'm supported in doing it, and I'm rewarded for doing it. And I'm going to do it the way that it was designed. And they get the best outcomes. Not a surprise. So who are these teachers? This red line up here? These are teachers who say, no, I'm not expected to do this. I'm certainly not supported, and hell no, there's no rewards for doing this, and I'm not going to do it. It's not appropriate for my classroom. It's not appropriate for my school, and they're doing something else. Now, when we look qualitatively at these teachers, these teachers are older. They've been doing this for a much longer time. They often work in very challenging schools, um, and yet they're able to get good outcomes. So we have a lot to learn from these teachers in thinking about how to implement interventions. But what was really sad is these guys. These guys are saying, it's not expected, it's not supported, it's not rewarded, but damn it, I'm going to do it anyway. right? And so they do it the way it's designed, but they don't get good outcomes. So we have um, one of the things with this group is we may need to think about how to change the climate in their schools. So one possibility is the place to focus is on schools. Did you have a question? Hello? Yeah, thanks. There you go. Okay. Um, two questions. Yes. Uh, is the red line and the blue line, uh, are they lines that you drew to fit the, the data? Yes, these are we, we are, we fit these lines to the slope of the data. Second question. Uh, can you tell me the difference between the circles and the X's? Um, can I tell you the difference between the circles and the X's? There is probably a point at which I could tell you the difference between the circles and the x's. But I'm not sure of the difference between the circles and the x's at this point. I will get back to you on that. Um, all right. So one possibility is it's the, um, one possibility is it's, it's the school. And if we want to make changes in the, uh, 
in how autism intervention is delivered in schools that we need to focus on the extent to which the principal supports and rewards teachers for doing this, the way that we provide supports in the classroom to doing this. And we've been trying to think about what are the models that are out there that we can borrow from that would allow us to apply, uh, that we could apply in, in these settings. And one of the places that we've been looking is at social psychology, where they think a lot about behavior change. And we've come to realize that to the extent we want teachers to implement these programs, what we are focusing on is adult behavior change. So they think about health behaviors um, often, uh, like exercise or drug use or condom use. And we're arguing it might be a short hop from those things to discrete trial training. Right, which we want, which we want our, uh, our teachers to do. So in that model, the most proximal determinant of behavior, that is, in our case, the extent to which teachers implement these interventions the way that they're designed, is intentions. Right? That's asking, like saying, over the next three weeks, are you going to do X? Or how likely is it that you're going to do X? And that intentions are influenced by three things, by attitudes, by norms, and self-efficacy. Attitudes, I mean, we can sum this up as saying attitudes are, this is a smart thing to do, it's a stupid thing to do, right? Norms, other people like me are doing it, or it's expected of me that I will do it, or not. And self-efficacy, if I wanted to do this, I could do this, right? And one of the things that was very powerful for us about this model and really resonated with us is we have a lot of teachers who's got great skill and great self-efficacy. So when we would go into a classroom to observe a classroom, We'd say, can we see you do discrete trial training? Or can we see you do pivotal response training? And some of the teachers tried and they couldn't do it. Some of the teachers, it was part of their natural day. Other teachers, we'd walk in and they'd roll their eyes and they'd say, oh, you're here. What do you want to see? We'd say, we'd like to see discrete trial training. OK. And they'd pull aside a kid and they'd pull out the materials that they need for discrete trial training and they'd do beautiful discrete trial training. Their ability to do these evidence-based interventions with kids was exactly what you would want. But, but they had to blow the dust off those materials when we came into the classroom. They were not using it when we weren't there. Now, this is generally our strategy. When we find that people aren't doing what we want them to do in these settings, we provide more training. And if they're still not doing it, we provide more training. Right? That is our model of thinking about behavior change for clinicians or for schools. For some teachers, for some clinicians, that may be an appropriate model. But for many others, I don't think it is. I don't think that self-efficacy or skill is the issue. I think they are working in an environment and have a set of beliefs, beliefs where this doesn't fit into their pedagogy, or they don't feel like they have the right environmental, uh, they don't have the right resources to do this. And to the extent that we're going to help change and shift teacher behavior, it's got to be by focusing on their attitudes and their norms. So now, how does or I talked about organization on the slide before that. How does organization fit into this? Well, the social psychologists lump the things we think about as organizational characteristics into what they call environment. Right? And we think about that as policies, the extent to which you have, and those are those policies that I showed before. They can be important. The training you provide, the culture that's created here in, 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 uh, in the organization, the climate, like the implementation climate that we were talking about, and leadership. We, the more we do this, the more we think that principles are really, really important. Even though they don't know anything about autism, their expectations and the, and, and, and the directives that they set for the school really influence what intervention is implemented. And we think that that influences the beliefs that in turn influence the determinants of intention. But we also think that those organizational characteristics, and these are those poor teachers who implemented the intervention with fidelity but didn't get good outcomes, it, it affects, it moderates the effect, the, the association between intentions and behavior. That is, there are times when I can have the strongest intentions to do something. I want to do it. I believe I could do it. I believe it's a smart thing to do. But if I don't have the right resources, I'm not going to be able to do it. For example, if I have 10 kids with autism in my class, and I have one classroom assistant, and that classroom assistant goes out on disability for the year, and it takes them six months to replace that uh, classroom assistant, or if I need curricular materials, and I put in an order repeatedly for those materials, and I don't get them, then I'm not going to be able to implement the program as designed. Those things, relatively, I think, are easy to fix. 
right? It's the other stuff that may be more challenging when we're dealing with the messiness of human behavior. So this is, the, um, this is sort of the model that we've begun to take forward in doing this. And we are in the midst now of a series of experiments to try and test this model and think about how in a large urban school district you would implement this model and aspects of this model meaningfully. The first thing we had to deal with is what do we mean by autism intervention? So when we went to the social psychologist and we said to them, we want your help in thinking about why teachers don't implement these these interventions, the way they're designed, they said, well, what do you want the teachers to do? And we said, well, we want them to implement STAR, because after we finished our study, that was the program that the school district chose as its standard for kindergarten through second grade autism support classrooms. And they said, what's STAR? And we explained what STAR was, and they laughed, and they said, that's not a behavior. That's not even a repertoire of behaviors. That's some aspirational goal. What do you want teachers to do? And we spent a lot of time going back and forth between the intervention developers and these social psychologists to come up with the specific things that we wanted them to do. And this is a place, I think, where autism intervention developers fall down. Because we come up with these really complex, comprehensive models for autism intervention that are challenging to implement and have many, many moving parts. And it's not clear how you train and support individuals in implementing those who weren't raised in the culture of that, of that intervention. Um, and every time we tried to come up with stuff, the intervention developers would say, well, it's more complicated than that. You can't just say that. And we go back to the social psychologist, and they'd say, that's still not a single behavior. That's a lot of behaviors you're asking people to do. And, I'll, and I'm going to show you another slide in a minute that, that explains why that's really important. So here's what we settled on, just as proof of concept. We said, you've got to use positive reinforcement as your primary classroom management strategy. That could be a token economy. That could be measured by having a high praise to behavior correction ratio. That is, I praise children for their behavior a lot more than I correct their behavior. Right? Those are two ways we can measure that. You've got to use uh, good transition routines. And we, we thought of the best example of that was visual schedules. You've got to have visual schedules for your kids so that they learn independence so they can learn to organize their day and where they're supposed to go without you, um, without you have to hovering over them uh, all the time, right? You've got to pull kids for one-to-one -one instruction, either discrete trial training or pivotal response training. And poor Miss Betty Ives Adams, uh, her, her, she's one of the teachers whose assistant was out for half the year in disability, so she's doing two-to-one instead of one-to-one, -one, but we'll give her credit for that, that she could even do that. And you got to take data, right? Because how else are you going to know whether your kids are making progress? And how else are you going to celebrate your successes? How else are you going to know when it's time to move on um, to a different goal or to change the intervention modality you're using? So we decided these are the four things that you've, you've got to do. Um, and then we went back and we asked teachers, well, what are your intentions about these four things? So these are things we've been training them on for several years. Right? And we asked them, how likely over the next three weeks are you to use positive reinforcement as a classroom management strategy as evidenced by a high praise to behavior correction ratio or, or um, using a token economy? So we asked them about positive reinforcement. We asked them about using visual schedules. We asked them about one-to-one -one instruction. And we asked them about data collection. And what was very interesting to us is that the intentions varied greatly across these four behaviors. So these four things, these four things are part of almost every one of the 29 evidence-based comprehensive treatment models for children with autism. Right? This is what all of them tell you that you're supposed to do. And yet, two-thirds of our teachers said that they intended to use positive reinforcement. I don't know who those other third of the teachers are, and I'm kind of worried about them. But <laughs> But at least, but two thirds said, I strongly intend to use positive reinforcement as my main classroom uh, management strategy. A third said that they strongly intend to collect data. So if I have a single program that wraps all four of these things together, and I tell teachers that it's really important that you do all four of them, it may be that at best, this is the rate limiting step. And only a third of the teachers are going to do it. Whereas if I said, Let's start with positive reinforcement. We want to help you with classroom management, and we're going to teach you about positive reinforcement. After that, we're going to layer on schedules. We're going to go from the, the least aversive thing for you as a teacher, 
to the most aversive thing so that we can build trust, so that we can help you develop a program, so that we can convince you of, of the value of these things. And this has totally changed the way we do coaching in the classroom. We now have a contract with the school district of Philadelphia, and we have a contract with Philadelphia's early intervention system to provide teacher training and coaching. And we used to be, we tried to teach them about all four of these things at once in our train and pray training. And then when we sent our coaches out to the classroom, they would coach on all four of these things. Now we coach on positive reinforcement and visual schedules for the first semester, and we don't really get to these things until the second semester. And by the end of the year, our fidelity to all four is much higher than it ever was when we were trying to coach on all four things concurrently. Right? So we think that this is a huge part of, um, of uh, classroom, uh, uh, of helping to support teachers. That when we implement these comprehensive programs, we have to break them down. We have to scaffold for our teachers the same way we do for our kids with autism. Right? It's funny, I, I have grown fond of saying that we know so much about changing the behavior of individuals with autism. And when it comes to the people who work with them, we take everything we know about behavior change and we throw it out the window, right? And we say, here, do this. The other thing also is proof of concept. For these teachers, visual schedules, we then pay them a surprise visit two weeks later to see whether their intentions to use visual schedules predicted their use of visual schedules. Among teachers, who said that they strongly intend to use visual schedules, more than 90% of them were using visual schedules. Among those who gave any one of these responses, that is pretty strongly, but not very strongly, um, it was about 30%. In fact, so when you worked out that, that odds ratio, if they said they strongly intended to do it, they were six or seven times more likely to do it, or to be doing it when we paid them a surprise visit than if they said they weren't strongly intending to do it. So intentions turns out in this setting to be a good predictor of behavior. So what are some of the other things that we're trying to work on? One is I told you we changed our coaching model. The other is I think it's time for us to take advantage of technologies for working with children with autism in a different way than we've been thinking about. So we've been thinking about technologies for children with autism as focused on the child with autism. We've been thinking about how to use the iPad, how to use the computer for instruction for children with autism. I have some concerns about this. I'm actually in the middle of a study testing one of these computer-assisted interventions in the district. We're doing another randomized trial of a program called Teach Tom. And I'm, I'm a skeptic by nature. That's what scientists are supposed to be. Right? I think it has the potential to have a good effect for kids. On the one hand, you're getting more one-to-one -one instruction in them. The teacher could use it as another center. The teacher could use it as an opportunity while one kid's on the computer to pull other kids for one-to-one -one instruction. And the program itself may have value. On the other hand, teachers may decide that Teach Town uh, substitutes for one-to-one -one instruction and for data collection, and they don't have to do it anymore. And they could stop doing the practices we've been training them in for six or seven years. Right? Where I would rather see the technology focus is on the teacher. Right? We have so many ways that we could think about using technology to support these teachers. So here are some of the things that we have started to work on. One is we've created a social media site for our teachers. Can't use Facebook for this for two reasons. One is at the trainings, I asked teachers how many have Facebook accounts. 95% of them raised their hand. The other 5% are lying. Um, <laughs> and then. I say, how many of you would be, would be willing to link Facebook accounts to create this group? They're not, right? That's their private life, and they would like to keep it separate from their professional life, and I totally understand. So we created, and the other thing is on Facebook, you don't own the data, right? You don't, you don't own your data. Facebook owns those data, and there's the potential for protected information to be shared among teachers and for proprietary information to be shared among teachers. So we've used a site called Ning, which is another social media platform where you still own the data. And we've created, so we told teachers we were creating this website and we wanted them to be able to use it as an opportunity to share things that were working in their classrooms. We told them about it. Within two days, 76% of teachers had signed up for it. It was very excited for them. Now, they're more consumers than producers of information on this social media website. They're constantly going and asking questions that often our coaches are going on and answering. We're having a hard time converting to getting them to brag about themselves in this. The second thing we can use this technology for is remote and asynchronous consultation. So what, is, what I mean by that? We bought a bunch of iPads. 
We distributed those iPads to the, to the teachers. Even in the poorer schools, they have wireless internet now. And what we can do is set up that iPad so that we can watch the child interact, watch the teacher interact with the child and provide consultation concurrent with, uh, with, um, with that. So our, our coaches are not traveling over our very large district. They can, they can um, meet the needs of more teachers in a single day than they could before. We also use it for asynchronous uh, consultation so that uh, teachers can email in a question, can take a snippet of video, um, and send it to our coaches, and our coaches can respond very quickly. Our next step that we're going to is to, um, is, to, uh, is to use the iPad as a scheduling device for the teacher. We're great with visual schedules for kids with autism, but we all need a schedule. I am, I am lost without my, without my phone and my, my schedule on it, and teachers often have the same problem. You're in a very chaotic environment in the classroom, and uh, and sometimes you're doing circle time, and circle time is working beautifully. You love circle time. It's an exciting story. The kids are really into it. They're all sitting so nicely. And circle time is only supposed to be 15 minutes. But 15 minutes comes, and the kids are still sitting really nicely. And you're just, you, know, you just can't bring yourself to transition these kids yet. And you don't transition them until like 30 or 35 minutes when the kids start to melt down. And then it's too late. Um, and so what we are also thinking about is push out text reminders to the teachers based on the schedule that we've set with them that says it's time to transition. Remember, this is the transition routine you have for these kids for this activity so that we can be a support in the moment in those classrooms. This relates to two things we're also trying to do. One, um, the reality is broken is a wonderful example of this. Gamification is another. There are many books that are now coming out of the business literature about gamification of everyday activities. And we think about this all the time. It's a great marketing strategy. So you think about the status you can get from a leaderboard for having the most frequent flyer miles for your, uh, for your airline. Um, or if you are a reviewer for Yelp or for TripAdvisor or for Amazon, you can get status for being a reviewer whose reviews are read a lot or who get a lot of helpful votes. And people get really into this, even though it's valueless. You don't get any money for this. What you get is meaning, and you get meaning through status. And this appeals to a lot of people. And so we have been thinking about this with our teachers for, you know, can you give them points for how much data they collect? Can you give them status for uploading things to our social media website to share with other teachers? We've also been thinking about Atul Gawande's checklist manifesto. For those of you who are not familiar with it, um, there have been some really fascinating randomized trials showing that you can dramatically reduce um, the risk of error in, this, in, in surgery, in the operating room, by implementing a checklist. Right? Now, the checklist is more than just a checklist. It's also kind of an organizational intervention, and there are a lot of aspects of that. For instance, having the nurse be in charge of the checklist. Uh, and requiring and, and ha giving the nurse the option of shutting down the operation if she doesn't feel the checklist is being applied appropriately. So you're giving someone with formerly relatively low status much higher status. Well, in our classrooms, we have classroom assistants. And we have huge challenges between teachers and classroom assistants. We have issues of age and race and income that affect the relationship between the teacher and the classroom assistant. And when we can give that classroom assistant status, it dramatically changes the dynamic in the classroom. And the, um, and the classroom assistant becomes a much more active part of, uh, of the classroom. We have classrooms where not everybody knows their names. Why? Because in Philadelphia, like a lot of other places, we use um, outside behavioral health agencies to provide one-to-one -one support for kids in the classroom. Often, it's a new worker who's coming into the classroom who doesn't necessarily introduce him or herself to the teacher. Um, and we will go into a classroom and ask the teacher, oh, did you get somebody new? She goes, I don't know who he is. Right? So we need to teach teachers about leadership in the classroom, being what it means to be a classroom leader, but also if there's a checklist that every day, anytime there's somebody new in the classroom, it becomes required that people introduce themselves to each other, that then becomes just a logical step of the classroom. So that's another thing that we are in the process of testing now. And the way we're testing it, is uh, developing it, is the same way that they developed the checklist for the surgical operating room. We are pulling together teachers and we're having them come up with the checklist. Because we think if they come up with the checklist, we'll, it will be a much, um, 
you'll be much more likely to, to, to implement it, right? And so we'll, we're also going to test, does it only get implemented among the people who develop the checklist? That is, do you have to be part of the development team for it to work? Or can, we're also going to have a second group where we test the checklist um, in, a, in a group that didn't develop the checklist to see if we get the same results. And the final thing is what are often called, what's often called behavioral economics. And uh, Richard Taylor and Cass Sunstein's book, Nudge, is a, is a wonderful, easy lay read about behavioral, uh, behavioral economics. Um, in the healthcare field, we've been thinking about this a lot, and we call it pay for performance, right? How do we incentivize the behaviors that we want in teachers? And we're actually trying this not with teachers, but in community mental health centers with, uh, with clinicians who are working with kids. What happens if we pay you to implement these interventions the way they're designed? Can we circumvent all those organizational challenges? And will you be motivated enough by this additional pay? And the way we're doing that is by audio taping and videotaping their sessions with kids and, uh, and seeing if it makes a difference. I think the big point that I want to make with these things, and these are, there are, I'm sure you guys have a million of them, that we could sit here for another hour or a day or a week and come up with all the challenges that these teachers and clinicians face and think about ways to address them using principles that we can borrow from other fields. One of the big points I wanted to make today, though, is that the policies that we have in place do a great job of ensuring access or increasing access. They may be necessary, but they're not sufficient if what we ultimately want to do is improve quality and outcomes. And that we have to think at a more granular level about what it is we are asking people to do and how we can support them in doing it. And having a policy that requires that we educate all children or that all children have an IEP um, or that they are entitled to certain things is, is not enough. The 2004 reauthorization of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act for the first time mentions outcomes and mentions evidence-based practice. Before that, those words were not in that legislative lexicon. But when you look at the lawsuits that are brought against school districts for not providing appropriate care to individuals with autism, that 2004 legislation hasn't had any effect in what people are asking for. People are asking for more inclusion, which is important. People are asking for um, more staff in the classroom, which could be important. I don't know that it's always important. But what they haven't taken advantage of is saying we need to focus on measurable outcomes and we need to focus on having evidence-based practices implemented in the classroom, which is, I think, where we should be going. So that's sort of a call to policymakers and to um, legislators and people who litigate. There's also a call to interventionists. Right? I think that this traditional pipeline approach of developing and testing interventions is not going to improve quality of care for people with autism the way that we would hope. There's too big a gap between how we test them, what we test, and what's feasible and acceptable and possible in community settings. What I would like to see is us jumping almost straight to the effectiveness design. Right? That we should be partnering with the community providers and agencies that we ultimately hope will use the interventions we're developing to make sure that what we're doing is feasible and possible with the skills and resources that they have. Otherwise, we're doing two things. It's sort of proof of concept about intervention in a way that is not going to ultimately work. Or we're just creating a great set of master clinicians. Because you go and work in these, in these labs, and you become an amazing clinician. And that's great, but it doesn't do a lot to improve outcomes for people uh, with autism. And that is sort of my last point about working directly with those community providers and not just thinking about skill, but thinking about the environments in which they work and how we can improve them and how we can not just increase their skill, but also increase their motivation to implement the programs that we want. I will stop there. I am out of time. I am happy to take questions.